Welcome to Conversations the World Over. I'm Raymond Arroyo. Tonight we talk with one of the great legends of journalism, the famed political reporter Robert Novak. I sat down with him in 2007 to discuss his memoir covering his five-decade career as the dean of political reporting. It was titled The Prince of Darkness, a nickname Bob acquired in the 1950s for his somewhat pessimistic view of politics here in the nation's capital. We talked about his life, his long career in D.C., including his syndicated column and his TV work. He also reflected on the many U.S. presidents he covered over the years. Sadly, Bob passed away in 2009, but his legacy will never be forgotten. Here's a part of my conversation with the late, great Robert Novak. Bob, what a fantastic book, The Prince of Darkness, 50 Years Reporting in Washington, D.C. Uh, I want to start with your view of what you do each day. You consider this a public service to the country. Oh, I don't know about that. I'm a private citizen, I'm, uh, so I don't have any responsibilities to, uh, to the government, just to uh, my God and my family and myself. Uh, what I do each day is uh, I try to learn what's happening on interesting subjects and s in important subjects. I try to find out things that are not available <clears throat> to the ordinary public, mm -hmm. that uh, are not, uh, that are hidden from view. And that's what I think an investigator, a reporter's investigative function is, mm -hmm. to uh, really reveal uh, things that the politicians and the, and the governing class don't want you to know. In the book you say something, you say, uh, I enjoy making life miserable for hyper, uh, uh, hypocritical, posturing politicians. As most of them are. <laughs> <laughs> and your column is read, we should tell those living outside the Beltway, this column is read voraciously in town, also across the country, but certainly in town, it's mandatory reading. And you always try to include, if memory serves, one new bit of information in every column. Every column, yes. And that's, so each day, as you say, what well, I do each day, I try, try to find that new information, try to, try to uh, 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 look for it, probe for it, to uh, just uh, kind of throw some lines out and maybe some, maybe some of the fish will bite. And royal the waters. That's it? right. I want to I look at your background. Is the, the, you really paint a fascinating picture of your entire childhood growing up. And I want to explore a bit how the seeds of that childhood really led you down this path of journalism that's uh, you know, been so illustrious and, and uh, bared such incredible fruit all these years. Maurice and Jane Novak, what of your parents do you see in yourself? Well, my father was a, uh, a, a great uh, interest in, in public affairs. He was a chemical engineer. Um, my parents were uh, both children of immigrants, Jewish immigrants. And uh, uh, he was, a, uh, was very much interested in political life, public affairs. And I see a lot of that of me in him. He loved, loved sports, and I like sports. Mm -hmm. And uh, my mother wanted to know everything that was going on. I think she was a a natural born reporter, but she, <laughs> she never was in journalism. So I see something uh, of that now. Uh, uh, they, were, they were people that most people love. A lot of people don't love me. So uh, it's, uh, uh, I, don't, I don't take credit for my, I don't blame my brace of personality on my parents. Oh, well, there are a lot of people who do love you, Bob. Let's not be, let, let's, let's not cut everybody out. You refer, you, you have in the book, you were called the little baby Jesus by family members. By my, my, I, had a, I had a number of, uh, about a dozen uh, female cousins. I was the only uh, <clears throat> boy, a uh, young boy cousin in, the, in an extended family. And <clears throat> And I was an only child. And wow. so uh, they thought my parents treated me uh, like a little baby Jesus. <laughs> what was your religious training like? Uh, we were uh, nominally observant Jews. That is, we'd go to uh, services on the high holidays, uh, no time else. Uh, my, my grandfather, my father's father, had been a, uh, a Russian immigrant. He'd been in the Russian Imperial Army. He was, a, he was definitely a non-observing Jew. And none of his sons were or bar mitzvah, my father was not. But I was bar mitzvah, my father wanted me to. And uh, that was about the end of my religious observance. I kind of drifted away from the Jewish religion after my, my by bar mitzvah and never took it up again. Hmm. I want to talk later about your conversion because it's an interesting, um, really fascinating evolution there. You started writing sports journalism, right? That's right. I was, uh, I was a 
uh, all of my, my father and, and his brothers and my uncles and my, others, my mother's siblings were all good athletes. I was not. So uh, I ended up, instead of being an athlete, a sports writer, started off uh, writing. I was the manager of the track team in high school. I started writing uh, stories about, I always knew I wanted to be a journalist. Why? Have, don't ask me. I knew. And, but I started writing sports stories. And all through uh, high school, I was uh, stringing for the local paper. And then they had me coming in and working weekends. And then after I graduated from high school in the summer, where I learned all kinds of things besides sports, how to cover a police story, government. I even did uh, home furnishings for a while, <laughs> wrote a lot of obituaries. And uh, so I got, that was my school of journalism. Mm. And then you, you work at the, for the AP, and you're covering kind of local politics, right? I was, I was covered after, I, I was in the Army after mm -hmm. college, and after two years in the Army, I, was, I covered the Nebraska legislature, the Indiana legislature, and then at the ripe old age of 26, I was lucky enough that they was transferred to Washington, help cover Congress. Did you want to come to Washington? Oh, I can't tell you how I wanted to come to Washington. I thought I'd died and gone to heaven when I, <laughs> when I came to Washington. That was, and I was very lucky. I've been, I've had a combination. I worked very hard and have a lot of good fortune. And I've always thought I've, I've been blessed. And uh, uh, at that time, it was very unusual for a 26-year-old kid to get transferred by the AP. Mm. How, did this, how has this town changed since you've been here, since you came here at 26? Remarkably. It was a kind of a dowdy, slightly southern town. None of the posh New York-style restaurants, none of the fancy uh, apartment buildings, such as the one we're in right here. Mm -hmm. it, was, it was a little bit down, down at the heels. Uh, uh, Pennsylvania Avenue was uh, was kind of slovenly. Uh, it's, it looked it looked different. It was different, and it was it was a, there was less money in the town. This is a big money town. It's like New York now. Oh yeah, well, but prob probably mostly owing to the lobbyist uh, institution exactly. that's taken hold. Has that destroyed politics here in town? And what effect has it had on journalism? The money that sloshes around Washington. I think it has changed politics. I think it's changed uh, journalism tremendously. Uh, there's much less uh, attempt of, of collegiality, of cordiality, of trying to get along, trying to reach, reach settlements. It's a, there's a kind of a, a crudeness uh, about it. And uh, it's really changed journalism tremendously. Uh, just, I guess it's not a bad thing. Journalists get paid a lot more right. than they used to. But it's much more of a, a big business money game much less simple than it used to be. It's much more vicious personally, it too. Is. It and is. You, I mean, it, the amazing thing to me is now journalists have become the stories, or at times get drafted into the story, as you, as you have written a book about. Um, does that, is, how good or bad is that for the information that the common man is receiving back home? What influence does it I have? Think it, I think it tends to distort the information. Uh, in the, doing the research for the book and uh, on the event of my 50th anniversary of being in Washington, I was looking at some of the papers, so 50 years ago, Washington Post, New York Times, sure. and so on. And believe it or not, the stories were about what happened yesterday, you know? <laughs> they weren't about analysis, they weren't about uh, uh, philo philosophizing, they weren't editorializing, they were just factual accounts of what happened yesterday. You don't have that today. Mm. And, and the people could make their own conclusions. Now, we have an awful lot of analytical material. Uh, the journalists are much better educated than they were then, but I don't, I don't know if the public is getting as good a picture. Mm -hmm. Tell me about Roland Evans. Um, you were at the time at the Wall Street Journal, correct? He's at the Herald Tribune. He called, he, uh, I had just coming back from my honeymoon from Spain in 1962, and I have a message that he wants to get a hold of me, and uh, I've been calling me every day, and I call him back. He wants to have lunch at, the, at, the, uh, uh, at a very low scale, uh, beef house, uh, so that uh, so nobody would see us there. You know, um, I could. I've had a lot of surprises in my life, but that what he said. He was been offered to do a six day a week column syndicated by the New York Herald Tribune, but he couldn't do it himself. But he needed a partner, and he wanted me as his partner. I had not exchanged ten words with him in my life. He was from a different social milieu. He was a friend of the Kennedys. He was a, a socialite. Kind of patrician. I mean, very was, patrician. Yeah, uh, His family didn't came up, come over on the Mayflower, but not much long after that. <laughs> Naturally Episcopalian, yeah. uh, although originally they had been Quakers in, in, uh, in Pennsylvania. And, uh, but he, he, he knew me. I was surprised he even knew who I was. Why do you think he chose you, Bob? He thought I was a good reporter. Uh -huh. And we were going to do a reporting column that was 
higher on facts and less on opinion, six days a week, had to work very hard to do it, and he thought I was a good reporter. Mm -hmm. So that was a great compliment, and we had a lot of negotiating to do, but that's, that's what we did. Well, and it was the beginning of an incredible institution that persists to this day, even in his absence. How did you work? Now, I remember, I worked for you for a time, and I can remember these loud voices as if we were down at a bar for sailors on the wharf. Everything but broken bottles we could hear behind those doors. We, what was happening in We your had a fight every day. <laughs> I know it. And uh, um, I used to say we fought about everything but money, but truth be told, sometimes we fought about money. <laughs> it, was, it was not the usual fight. The usual fight was what was in the column, who was going to write what, how we were going to write it. Sometimes we'd fight over the word. Mm -hmm. and. Um, uh, I said in the book that uh, it was, uh, I, he was more of a brother than a friend, mm -hmm. uh, as brothers sometimes have a, a strange relationship, <laughs> a combative relationship, but we got the column out every day of the, of the week. Hmm. How did you work? Tell me how you all worked together. Did all that friction, all that passion, all that argument, in some ways, didn't that add to the vivacity it, it, of the it, column? It really did, it, and, and you knew when you wrote something, uh, a lot of com a lot of trouble with a lot of columns is they, uh, they, they please themselves and they don't please anybody else and then nobody wants to print it. Mm -hmm. but, but I knew I had the sharpest, harshest critic I could find in Rolly Evans. Mm -hmm. And he had the har harshest critic he could find in, in, uh, in Bob Novak. And uh, it, was a, it was a really a, a, uh, um, uh, uh, an amalgam. What, what we would do is we'd start off in the morning and decide who had the, the best idea. And then that person would write the column, and then, oh, we hoped he would get a first draft done by about 4 o'clock in the afternoon. Mm -hmm. And the other person would get the column, and uh, we had Art Bookwald used to be across the hall from us, mm -hmm. and he said the way we did it is after the guy wrote that column, spent all day writing it, the other person would take it, <laughs> cross it all out, and pencil in a new column. <laughs> well, that wasn't quite true, but not well, so far from the truth. I love it. What did you learn from him, from working with Raleigh and the way he worked? I, I, I learned that you never give up in reporting a story. Mm -hmm. uh, he and many of, you know, he was, a lot of people thought he was a little white shoe uh, mm -hmm. society boy and I was a, uh, you know, a tough uh, guy from the Midwest. Mm -hmm. But he was in many ways a more tenacious reporter even than I was. And he never gave up on a story. Make that last phone call. Don't give up. And that, that, was, that was the lesson I got from him. Mm. Do you miss him? Do you miss oh, sure. Well? Sure. I say in the book that uh, after he, he retired uh, after 30 years, and uh, I said in many ways it was, it was easier writing the column because I, uh, it, it took yeah. about two hours of the time of, of preparation <laughs> off the column, but, uh, but I missed having him there as a, as a critic. You also did the eulogy at his funeral. Yes, I did. That was very interesting that I was the only eulogist, and hmm. I was a long way from being his best friend, but I say I was like a brother. And uh, all, all the friends he had from his uh, the fancy people in Georgetown, the society circuit, and he asked me to do, he picked me to do the, the eulogy. Hmm. Let's talk for a moment about, uh, you mentioned Karl Rove in the book, uh, the, the president's counselor. Um, and you say we, have a, we had a symbiotic relationship built on self-interest and that this is the rule of DC journalism. One of the things that I love about the book is it really gives people an insider's view of what happens here, how information is shared, and why. Um, is that good in the long run, that kind of relationship? Well, it's the way it works, and it's the way I find out things. Mm -hmm. uh, did, uh, uh, did, I, did he uh, tell me everything was happening in, in, the, in the administration? Of course not. Did I buy everything he was trying to sell to me? Of course not. But what he did do, he, he told me a lot of things. He, he got me away from things that were, were incorrect. He suggested ideas. And the symbiotic relationship was that I was getting information from him, and he was getting a, an appraisal that was friendly from me. Now, you say that's a kind of a corrupt relationship, but I don't think it is. I think it's the way, it's the way journalists work. It's the way Bob Woodward works. It's the way, in the old days, Jack Anderson worked, Drew Pearson, and people who are not just sitting, sucking their thumb and saying, what do I think of this, but finding out what's really happening behind closed doors. That's the way they have to act. Mm -hmm. One of the things I loved watching you work up close for, you know, for the time I, I was in your office, and it's something I, I, I've, I've been able to import and a great lesson that I hope those who are practicing journalists or, or aspirants absorb this. 
it was amazing to me you'd get a little bit of information at a luncheon. And you mention in the book, you say, nuggets of news often drop in an informal setting. And I love that, because it's true. The moment you bring the pen or one of these horrible cameras in, you're done. That's they right. won't tell you anything. That's right. But those informal things, you pick up those great nuggets. Then you would work those phones all afternoon, calling every official, cross-checking them, not telling them where you got the information, That's right. and almost playing one against the other. That's right. And sometimes you, know, you call somebody up and, and you say, how are you doing? You know, and, and you don't say what you want. And you say, uh, you know, how is this, how is this uh, issue going? You couldn't care less about that issue. Mm -hmm. And then suddenly, you lead them into the thing you really want to talk, them, talk to them about, and, and, that, and that, that's the way it works. And wham, they're in the Novak body slam, never to escape. Uh, was there ever a golden age of bipartisanship? We keep hearing that. You know, everybody got along, Democrats and Republicans, and Tip O'Neill and Reagan sharing beers. Is that just a myth? I think it's, it's, it's strictly exaggerated. In fact, it was really much more violent in the early days of the Republic. There was story I like to tell about Senator Sam Houston was a senator from Tennessee and uh, he was challenged to a duel by an uh, opponent from the House and walking on Sunday night in front of Boyer House on Pennsylvania Avenue he saw the man who had challenged him he thought he was coming after him so Sam pulled out a gun and shot him see <laughs> and the guy lived but uh, but uh, so things are not that bad we had a case as you know uh, uh, just as the Civil War was starting before it started where a senator was nearly beaten to death by an uh, 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 emancipation senator from the Northeast was nearly beaten to death by a Southern House member uh, with, a, with his cane <laughs> on the floor of the Senate. We don't do that. No, you know? not that bad. Yeah. But, but, but we do it in, in the, using the media today, I think, more often than not, trying to disparage and kill people's reputations. Yes. I think this is a period, I think it, there's ebbs and flows, and I think this is a period of, of less cordiality than, than there used to be. Um, I was uh, interviewed, uh, today uh, uh, by Joe Scarborough of uh, mm -hmm. MSNBC, he used to be a congressman. Mm -hmm. And jo Joe came in with that big class of 94, and he told me that he never spent one weekend in Washington, all the time he was in Congress. He was in Congress for several years. And, uh, and that, is, that, is, that didn't surprise me at all, that is true. They, the, there's very little social life now among the, co the, the congressmen and their families. They used to have, have uh, one, th Congressman would have a family as guests of another, and they'd invite uh, journalists and their families. But that, there is very little of that life in Washington now. Mm -hmm, that culture's dead. Mm -hmm. What do you make of the personal uh, attacks and smears? Uh, Larry Flint coming out and exposing sordid details of somebody's personal life. I mean, you were here during the Kennedy and the LBJ administration. Certainly, there were skeletons that were uh, known by the journalistic community. But those things were kind of not we recorded. Didn't, we didn't think they were. You see that? We had a, a much more access as reporters than most reporters have today. I have an incident in the book where uh, I was covering uh, Senator Ed Muskie when he was the front runner for the Democratic presidential nomination in 72. And he didn't like me much, but let me on his plane. Uh, he was flying from Milwaukee to Warsaw, Wisconsin on a Sunday morning. And this will interest you. And he was in a rage because he hadn't been scheduled for mass any, any time that day. And he was screaming. He had a violent temper, Muskie. You know, everybody thought he was uh, uh, the st stoic New Englander. He had violent temper, and he was screaming at the at the advanced man how important it was for him to go to mass. And I was not a Catholic. It didn't, I thought it was pretty funny, but I didn't write a word of it. That's the point. Not one word. Today, that all would be written in in, in uh, a reporter. But I don't know if the reporter would be left on on the plane. Hmm. Senator Obama, I am told. Uh, does not let any reporter on his SUV. He does not go on the reporter's bus. It is a there's a big uh, iron curtain between the the newsmen and the, and the press because they don't trust each other. Mm. And that's a bad, bad uh, uh, relationship, and certainly terrible for the people. Uh, you settle a few scores in this book, <laughs> which I, I I have to say I took some <laughs> devilish pleasure in. Uh, Chris Matthews, um, tell me your relationship with Chris Matthews. Chris Matthews uh, uh, and I were on, on crossfire. I had known Chris when he was an aide to Speaker O'Neill. Speaker O'Neill wrote a, uh, in his memoirs, wrote a lie about me and Rowley. It was just an absolute lie. And uh, that he had kicked us out of his office when we had 
I virtually offered him a bribe. Just a canard. The book is full of lies. Mm. But I wrote, wrote about that. And, and Chris Matthews, uh, on the, uh, we got into a little thing on Crossfire before he had his own program on MSNBC. And Chris uh, kept saying, I was there. He was giving the impression he was there at the time I was kicked off. He witnessed he was, you being thrown and out. And he wasn't even on his staff when this alleged incident happened, which never happened. Huh. So that, that uh, broke our relationship. And uh, uh, we see each other and we nod, but uh, I don't speak to him. You've never been on Hardball? I was asked in, in the early years many times, but I, I told him to stop asking me because I never would go on. <laughs> what about uh, John McLaughlin, an institution on television with his McLaughlin group? Well, uh, I was present at the creation of the McLaughlin group, as I tell in the book. Uh, mm -hmm. he, uh, he didn't know much about journalism. It's a, it's, a, it's a miracle that he was able to put this together, but he, he got me as his first panelist, and he asked me a lot of advice, and I don't think I ever liked John very much, but, uh, but we were... <laughs> We, were, we worked closely together, but once he got it settled, he got very arrogant, and, uh, and I left the program because uh, I just couldn't stand him anymore and uh, started the Capital Gang. I, I was the uh, founder and uh, executive, co-executive producer of the, of the Capital Gang on, on CNN. Founding Capital Gang, founding Evans and Novak, you were, you were executive producer of both of those programs. You were also uh, on Crossfire for many years. Uh, and present really at the founding of CNN as well. Tell I was the last that. person on the air the first weekend to still be on the payroll. I was the, I was the, the last of the Mohicans. Huh. How did that happen? Being your last? relationship with CNN. How did I got there? Right. Uh, well, like most things in, in, uh, in, the, in this business, it's who you know. Uh, Ed Turner uh, was the uh, uh, executive vice president for news at the beginning of CNN, and he had. Uh, he had been the news, direct, news director of Channel 5 in Washington when it was the Metro Media Station. And he had, uh, he had given Raleigh and me our first real television uh, work as columnists uh, doing political Channel commentary. Five. Pardon? On Channel 5. On Channel 5 in 1966. And for a while we had a, uh, a weekly interview program called the Evans and Novak program, which had a, a twist in it that Time Magazine did a big story on that after, after the interview was over, we we'd comment on it, right. and that was, that was very unusual in those, <laughs> in those days. And so uh, when Ed uh, was taken on as, at CNN by Ted Turner, no, no relation, uh, one of the first people who came to was us to ask us to go to the, on the network. What happened there at the end? At the end, two things happened. Uh, uh, the CNN was losing the ratings war to, uh, to Fox, and they brought in some new management. They brought in a guy who was very well known in, Hollywood named Jonathan Klein, not very well known in the news, and uh, I didn't. I didn't have to talk to him long, and I could see he didn't like politics. It was not. It was not in his uh, in his bag, and uh, so he he canceled all the shows I was on, and uh, uh, I was still drawing the same payroll, mm -hmm. paycheck. But uh, you know, I'm I'm not as dumb as I look. And uh, when they cancel all his shows, you're on. You don't have much future with that. <laughs> you you with kind that of network. know that the, and that then, this is played out. Then the other thing is this uh, uh, Valerie Plame affair came, and I, I could tell they did not like my association with it. They gave me, uh, said they were, uh, uh, Mr. Mr. Klein told the interviewers that he was for me 100%. You know, like the baseball owners say that they're, mm -hmm. they're for the manager. Yeah. But uh, uh, by the time I uh, finally left, and. They said they weren't going to renew my contract when it came due, and, and I was very happy for that. I think the string had been run out. The thing that gave them the pretext to get rid of their conservative totem was a token, token. Uh, was to, uh, uh, I lost my temper when uh, one night on one of the rare shows I had been on, and uh, mm -hmm. uh, John, James uh, Carville was taunting me, and, mm -hmm. and I, uh, I stalked off the set with, a, with an expletive, and mm -hmm. as I knew as I walked off, uh, that gave them the out to get rid of me. Let me know what you thought of tonight's show and which of our interviews you'd like to see on an upcoming edition of Conversations the World Over. You can always write me at Raymond at RaymondArroyo.com. The new show premieres each Wednesday at 5.30 p.m. Eastern Time in the U.S. For those of you outside the United States, go to EWTN.com for your airtimes. Next week, the continuation of this conversation with the legendary political reporter Robert Novak. On behalf of the staff and crew of EWTN News, I'm Raymond Arroyo. The conversations continue. Don't miss them. Bye now.